Great. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'd also like to particularly thank Arlene of in engaging me over the years. When I first uh, started treating Waldenstrom's, I remember my first patient when in my first year of practice, and uh, it was an eye-opening experience for me, and Arlene's been kind of engaging me all the way through my career. So thank you very much, Arlene, and then Betty, of course, taking over the mantle. Um, Betty is one of my patients, so uh, thank you very much for having me to these educational forums. Um, I'm always really impressed with how engaged and informed the audience members are. Um, so they always usher me at the end after all these great U.S. speakers where they talk about all the treatments you have access to, because I always have to bring you down to the real life, what can we do in Canada, and uh, try to, um, I, I'm not going to present anything too wild and new here, it's more just to put a perspective on what uh, you've already heard today. So these are my disclosures for Janssen and Abvi. So what I'm going to do today is uh, uh, touch on a little bit of everything that you've heard today, uh, but provide a historical and maybe a current overview of Waldenstrom's treatment in Canada. Um, and I'm going to try to interject any useful comments about Health Canada approvals, drug access, any patterns of practice maybe specific to Ontario, and even some of our own uh, particular approaches from Princess Margaret, which is my institution. And I also would like to, um, you'll see that I'm going to weave a case through this talk. And it's a made up case, but it's made up actually of, of a whole bunch of my patient's stories kind of cobbled together. So you may actually recognize, some of my patients will recognize little bits of their story through here. I've already vetted it past all of you. So um, just uh, allow me, uh, or uh, allow me to thank all of my patients for uh, letting me have a little bit of their, their histories. So this is a 50 year old female, we'll just call her Jane. And back in 2002, she presents with mild fatigue, which is a very common presentation for Waldenstrom's, uh, as is anemia. So her hemoglobin is 93. You guys have seen all um, these numbers. A normal hemoglobin for females is about 120 to 130. Uh, and part of my role here after a bunch of US speakers is to try to get you reori reoriented to Canadian units. So this is grams per liter hemoglobin. In the US, it would be 9.3. Um, and an elevated IgM uh, level. So we use grams per liter. So you're going to see numbers like in the 3,000 ranges that you've seen in the, from our US speakers. Just move the decimal point over two. Um, patient uh, Jane has no lymph nodes, no fever, weight loss, sweats. Uh, she does have a bone marrow performed. And remember, this is 2002. We didn't know anything about mid-88 at that point. We do see that the findings are consistent with lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, which you've already seen. Um, shown in various slides to date today. Um, and then there's also the added finding of no iron stores in bone marrow. So the bone marrow is the best test, although we don't do it frequently to assess for iron. And we frequently see that uh, patients with Waldenstrom's have uh, low iron levels. And there are many different causes. It may be related to infiltration of the bone marrow with the disease. Patients could have immune-related complications. You've heard the, uh, a mention of this already, where the antibody can land on red cells and chew them up. Um, you can have such a high level of IgM protein in your blood that it kind of dilutes out your blood and it makes it look like you're anemic. And then, of course, if you've had treatments, then the chemotherapy can cause some suppression of your bone marrow function, which is where you make blood. Um, we also know from work from uh, Steve and uh, Jorge and others that uh, hepcidin is a hormone that is actually dysregulated in Waldenstrom's. So when it, it, it's, also, it's elevated and that suppresses your ability to absorb iron. So when we try to treat the iron in patients with uh, at WM, we often don't get very far with oral tablets and often have to go IV. So um, uh, another note is that blood markers may be inaccurate. Uh, because we frequently uh, see blood markers like ferritin, which is, measures iron stores in your blood, are frequently falsely high in Waldenstrom's because of the disease. So it, it's not very easy to pick up iron deficiency just from a blood test. Hence, a bone marrow test sometimes is helpful. 
So I only mention that because there are often other causes for anemia and Waldenstrom. So if it's your only symptom or only potential indication for treatment, we look really hard to make sure there's not another cause because we don't really want to give you chemo or other treatment specific to Waldenstrom's if there's iron deficiency from something else. Um, so this uh, patient, Jane, uh, goes on some oral iron, but it frequently isn't very easy to tolerate. People have stomach upset, maybe constipation. So she ends up uh, going on to intravenous iron instead, receives four infusions, and her hemoglobin actually rises to 119. Not quite normal, but close enough that she feels better. So we actually then just pursue a watch and wait approach for the next four years. So that's actually a pretty good long time. Um, we call her smoldering now. You've heard of smoldering Waldenstrom's already in previous presentations. Uh, this is where we definitely find the, the lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma in the bone marrow, but there aren't any other complications like low blood counts or neuropathy or big lymph nodes, etc. And you, if you look at the curves on the right, and you had a great primer from, uh, from Dr. Matus about looking at curves and things, you can see that the curve on the right just shows uh, year by year how um, what the rate is of developing active Waldenstrom's. And for the first five years, your rate is a little higher. So you'll see that we follow you a lot more closely if you're smoldering and we've just diagnosed you. So we might see you every three or four months. Then beyond five years, if you haven't become active, then we kind of relax a little bit. It becomes less likely. It's more like 2% per year. So we might just start seeing you every year. So that's kind of the pattern that we'll follow. There are a few indicators that may uh, tell us that we should be watching you a little more closely, that you're more likely to progress to active Waldenstrom's. And some of these uh, factors are listed below. And one useful one is the extent of involvement of your bone marrow. So if we did a bone marrow and you have more than 50% involvement with Waldenstrom cells, then by five years, virtually everybody has become active, needing treatment, as opposed to if you have less than 50% involvement, then uh, only about half of people have become active by five years. So it gives us a little bit of inkling and we can help you um, you know, plan uh, in advance a little bit for the next five, 10 years of your life. Um, so back to Jane. So now we're at 2006, so four years after she was treated with iron, and she starts to become anemic and tired again. Um, but this time she does get IV iron again, but it doesn't really do much. Her hemoglobin is falling, and this time her IgM level is also climbing. If you remember, it was in the uh, 20 range before. She's starting to get tired, and she's also noticing some sweating, particularly at night. So those are all symptoms. We call them B symptoms or constitutional symptoms that we all ask, well, physicians all ask you guys to keep track of because they may be an indication of progressing Waldenstrom's. Um, we don't scan everybody, but if we're about to start treatment, uh, I usually do do a set of scans to look for enlarged lymph nodes or liver spleen. And you've heard already that this isn't very common in Waldenstrom's. Probably only about 20% of people will have enlarged nodes. And she doesn't have any. And you've also seen this. This is just broken down into different ways of, uh, of listing the reasons why we might start treatment. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You've already seen it. But you can break it into clinical indications, so symptoms related to, as I said, fever, sweats, et cetera. Hyperviscosity you've heard about, only associated when people have fairly high IgM levels, um, or they have um, big liver spleen that bother them. So again, a lot of people, if I examine them, I'll be able to feel a big spleen, but if it doesn't bother you, you don't need to do anything about it. And then the peripheral neuropathy, which occurs in about 10% clinically, can be kind of plaguing for people, you know, often numbness, tingling, fingers, feet. And then there are other lab tests that we look for that you may not notice. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We've already gone over it. Um, the most common reason to start, as I mentioned, is if your hemoglobin starts to drop and you become anemic. And that can make you fatigued, maybe even short of breath. So remember, this is 2006, so Jane gets treatment, and she receives RCVP. So you're still going to see people out there, probably folks in this room, who have received this kind of treatment. 
We don't use it a lot these days, but you will see, see some variation of this. Uh, R is rituximab, C is cyclophosphamide, V is vincristine, P is prednisone. These are all IV except for the prednisone, which is a pill. Um, and the, the curves on the right are actually from, so, so until recently, as in maybe the last eight, nine years, most of our treatments for Waldenstrom's came from uh, studies in other diseases that were similar. And this set of curves on the right is a study in a follicular lymphoma, which is a slow-growing lymphoma, much like Waldenstrom's is, but not the same, and uh, compared CVP to the addition of rituximab RCVP, and we saw a big difference that people uh, kept their disease away longer, so that's the top curve, uh, when the rituximab was added. So that led to us in Canada and many places adopting a lot of these treatments. So many of you might have received this. Uh, we often switch out the, well, we often drop the vincristine because it does cause neuropathy, uh, a problem for Waldenstrom's patients. And, um, and the, there is an alternative to the uh, prednisone, we switch out to a more potent uh, steroid called dexamethasone, so that's called the CDR regimen. So we, you may still see us using these regimens sometimes. They're kind of old school. They are pretty easy to tolerate. Um, we know with rituximab, sometimes we'll see a flare. The IgM levels go up. This only occurs in about a third of patients on this type of regimen. But it's relatively slow to work, takes about four months before you see a response. So if you really have a lot of symptoms, we're not going to use something that's going to take you four months to feel better. Um, but the responses are pretty good and time before, like the duration that the disease stays stable can be in the range of three, maybe four years. So still not bad. So you'll see people uh, on these regimens. Uh, more so, we're seeing people now re progressing on them. And so this is just a slide. You're all familiar with rituximab. You've heard Jorge and others talk about it being an antibody to CD20. Uh, we all know that it does have side effects. Uh, a lot of them related to infusion, um, relate to how fast we infuse it, sort of um, allergic type reactions. It can make your hepatitis B if you've been exposed before flare up. And as I mentioned, it, it can cause a flare or an increase in your IgM levels. So if you're receiving any treatment with rituximab, sometimes it takes a long time for your IgM levels to sort of settle down. Um, rituximab has been tricky in the past to access in Canada and Ontario. Uh, it is approved for frontline treatment when you combine it with other chemo like the CVPR, like bendamustine, We've talk, we'll talk about that shortly. Um, but retreatment or treatment in other combinations can be hard to access. A lot of the times we do, you need to use private insurance. Um, and if you use insurance, then uh, often hospitals will not allow you to receive it within their institutions. You have to receive them in private clinics. Uh, so there are a variety of these private infusion clinics through Toronto. So. Um, uh, so the patient, remember, she got a somewhat old school treatment, RCVP, and then she goes on to maintenance rituximab. These are actually curves uh, from a study that uh, Steve Trion ran. It was a retrospective study, meaning they weren't putting patients on actively and following them through. They were just looking back at people who got rituximab or not for maintenance. And anytime you see curves splitting, you know there's some benefit to, to one of the groups. And, Rituximab uh, in this setting uh, at least validated that it seems to do something for keeping your disease quiet. But as you've already heard from others, uh, there are some cautions that more people seem to have sinus and, and uh, respiratory infections. They tend to get a lot of like nose dripping and uh, especially in uh, winter months, they have problems with uh, viral infections and uh, about 11% will be intolerant to rituximab uh, where they can't continue with it. So it can be problematic. Uh, there are some suggestions we can replace it with another kind of monoclonal antibody. Uh, there's one that is available, it's called obinutuzumab. It's again against CD20. It is available for CLL, not approved for uh, Waldenstrom's, but on occasion we can access it. It's a um, humanized antibody as opposed to half mouse, half human rituximab. 
And so it, it possibly can be better tolerated than rituximab. So just an option, um, mostly an option for people who have insurance coverage. So, um, so Jane unfortunately happens to be one of those people that can't uh, tolerate terribly well the rituximab maintenance. She has recurrent sinus and lung infections on and off antibiotics. And with the emerging data about the infectious uh, complications with rituximab, we're not pushing it as strongly as before. It is pretty standard in Ontario and in Canada to use rituximab maintenance to prolong how long, uh, the duration of response with your disease. But because of the risk of uh, infections, we, we don't uh, uh, push pe people to stay on if they're not tolerating it very well. Um, particularly if the Ig, this is meant to be IgG and IgA levels are low, we may want to stop the rituximab and start some replacement uh, immunoglobulins, uh, which you've already heard about as well, providing uh, the patients have significant enough infections. Again, this is a blood product. We don't like to use it if you uh, just have minor infections, but if you've had at least a couple of major infections, meaning you might need IV antibiotics or you might even have been in hospital, then we may feel it's worthwhile doing the IVIG. Um, so this is uh, an infusion of an antibody fraction of donated blood. So it is a blood product. So we don't like to give transfusions if we don't have to. It's um, the intravenous form is the traditional form, but there is a subcutaneous form now that you can give uh, in some locations and you get it uh, administered at home. Uh, and, um, um, and then in that setting, it's self-administered. At Princess Margaret, we're still using the intravenous form, but there are small centers. Uh, there's one at St. Mike's that will actually help you set up for subcutaneous injections if this is needed. I do want to make a note about vaccinations too, because we are trying to more routinely recommend vaccinations for patients. Um, we uh, have, I know you can't read this, but if you come to Princess Margaret, we have a uh, a fairly strict revaccination program for our transplant patients and we often use parts of this for other patients as well. It lists some things like the pneumonia vaccination, uh, the um, haemophilus vaccination. There are various ones that I think are worthwhile giving uh, or getting at any point, especially if you're not actively on treatment, to prepare you so that you prevent uh, or hope to prevent infections in the future. And as of last year, we do have access to this new shingles vaccine. You might remember that in the past, the shingles vaccine was a live vaccine and we discouraged people uh, with cancer from getting it because you can uh, actually get the virus from it. Uh, but the new Shingrix vaccine is actually an inactivated dead vaccine, so it's quite safe. There is an added cost to it though, because it's not covered by OHIP. So Jane finishes part of her rituximab maintenance um, and then she stops, she's on IVIG and she continues on a watch and wait approach, which is our standard. And at that point, she's feeling pretty good. Her IgM levels, unmeasurable, her hemoglobin's sort of in the normal range. So she goes another four years. So you, she's an example of someone who can have a very long uh, period between treatments. But then at that point, she develops a hard, painful lump in her right groin. Um, her hemoglobin and her IgM aren't changed though, and we sometimes see that. And we're, it makes us a bit concerned whenever we see one area that's growing out of sync with other areas, and there's no other evidence of disease growing, that maybe this is transformed lymphoma. And you've heard that already mentioned today. Transformed as in, the slow-growing Waldenstroms may become uh, or turn into a more active, aggressive lymphoma. Um, so uh, CAT scans are performed. There are no other large nodes. So this is concerning because there's a large six centimeter node just in one area in the right groin. And we do a PET scan. Uh, and you may, some of you may have had PET scans. So again, PET scans are very routinely performed in other kinds of lymphoma. For indolent lymphomas, uh, we don't tend to use them frequently except in settings. Uh, one example is in this setting where we want to look at whether there is transformation. Uh, and I'll show you a PET scan on the next slide. So you've already heard a bit about transformed disease 
earlier, so about 10% of Waldenstrom's patients may transform at some point in their disease course. Usually it occurs later after years and they've usually been treated already. And in Waldenstrom's, um, most patients have disease that's outside of the lymph nodes that, that raises the concern of transformation. It can be in the bone marrow, it could be in bone, it could be in brain. Um, pleura is the lining of the lung, skin, liver. Those are all areas that can be involved. And sometimes the tumors can be quite large. Um, the PET scans, PET scans are scans that uh, measure how metabolically active the, the tumors are. So uh, Waldenstrom's is not a very metabolically active disease. So if you PET scan someone who has quiet Waldenstrom's, it's not really gonna light up. But in a more aggressive uh, transformation, the site that's concerning may light up much more significantly. And that's measured by a unit called SUV uh, where uh, normal SUV, SUV, say, of liver or other areas might be in the range of one or two, and uh, transformed lymphoma might be up to 15. So I'm going to just show you an example of a PET scan. This is not in the same area as Jane, the case, but you can see that um, a, it kind of lights up the dark spot. This is a CAT scan where you're sort of cutting the body across the waist area, and you can see that uh, the top image is a PET scan that's not very active, whereas the middle scan shows a much more active SUV of eight. And this can really help us identify an area that we think we need to biopsy, because you don't want to biopsy a node somewhere that's uh, quiet. It'll just show you that it's Waldenstrom's. So we want to look for the site that might be transformed. So uh, Jane ends up, Jane only has one site, so we biopsy that. It's a core biopsy, meaning it's not just a needle sticking in looking for loose cells, but we actually put in a bigger needle and take out a little sliver of the lymph node. Uh, and that allows us to look at how the cells are sitting in the node and gives us a better idea of the type of lymphoma rather than just individual loose cells in fluid. Unfortunately, the core biopsy is not definitive, so the best test really is to take that whole lymph node out, which is what happens. She goes to surgery, and they just remove the lymph node, and luckily there's no transformation. So this is just Waldenstrom's, and although we talk a bit about maybe radiating the site or trying to um, do something locally there, she doesn't have disease elsewhere that's very active, so we end up sitting on her a little longer for another year but then she really does start to develop symptoms, fatigue, anemia, and she does have increasing lymph nodes elsewhere with, a, again, a rising uh, IgM level and dropping hemoglobin. So now she goes on uh, to be treated with bendamustine and rituximab. So this is referred to as BR. This is primarily a frontline regimen uh, based on the, a trial that was uh, uh, involving a variety of different kinds of slow-growing lymphomas, of which there was a smaller subset of Waldenstrom's patients. And uh, we saw in that Waldenstrom subset of 41 patients that the uh, top curve, again, any top curves look better, that uh, the duration of keeping the disease quiet before it became active again, or progression-free survival, <laughs> Was, um, was much longer for bendamustine rituximab in the red than for the standard treatment, which is RCHOP. Uh, some of you may be familiar with RCHOP. It's more of an aggressive lymphoma regimen, kind of a stepped up version of the RCVP I talked about before. And so based on this trial, in Canada, bendamustine rituximab has been our frontline treatment of choice for many years. Um, until recently with the advent of a Brutinib frontline. So uh, we can access this in relapse disease as well. Uh, in Ontario, the access to the rituximab is tricky. If you've had it once at the beginning, uh, then Ontario, Cancer Care Ontario, that funds chemos for patients, will only fund it a second time if you've shown that you have responded well enough and have had a year off treatment from rituximab without progressing. So they just want to uh, administer it to you if there's a good chance you're going to respond again to it. 
So what could you otherwise do though? Well, there are a bunch of other options that we tend not to use very often. I'm gonna run through these uh, quickly. The fludarabine combos, the RCHOP I mentioned before, uh, bortezomib or Velcade combinations. You've heard all these uh, from Jorge and others. Uh, fludarabine is a, a drug called a nucleoside analog. Uh, fludarabine, we used to use cladribine as well. Some of you may, uh, may have been treated with cladribine many years ago. These are uh, drugs that have largely fallen out of favor because they're pretty hard on the bone marrow. They drop your blood counts. They're hard on your immune system, so you're prone to infections. We usually have to give you antibiotics and antivirus drugs uh, at the same time to prevent infections. Um, but they can really lead to good and durable responses for years. You can see TTP means time to progression, so the time it takes to get to uh, progressive disease or event-free survival, which is EFS, it basically are different ways of stating how long the response can be, and these can be years uh, with just four to six months of treatment. So they're still pretty Im impressive, but the side effect profiles are really not very appealing. The RCHOP I already talked about uh, was inferior to bendamustine rituximab in terms of progression-free survival and also has more side effects that patients dislike, like hair loss. Uh, it's temporary, but people don't like to lose their hair. Uh, it is a regimen, though, we use for aggressive lymphoma, aiming to cure them. So often, if your disease is, uh, well, transforming or there's some aggressive component to it, might be a consideration. I simply list here that there are kind of variations of CHOPR, CVPR, which I mentioned before, or CPR, taking out the vincristine, again, because it causes neuropathy. They're all kind of similar, um, but you may still um, be considered for any of these regimens. Uh, we use them a lot in other uh, types of lymphoma. And then you've also heard about uh, the proteasome inhibitors, uh, of which the most common one is Velcade or bortezomib. So these, uh, just to quickly explain, a proteasome is like a, a bag of enzymes and it cleans up a lot of misfolded proteins in all your cells, but it also uh, breaks down some regulators of, of, of cell cycling, so it basically can cause, um, uh, well, it can lead to um, cells, uh, proteasomes, if they're active, will lead to inhibition, and ultimately the cells can keep growing. So we want to inhibit the proteasome, and bortezomib is the first proteasome inhibitor that's on the market, that has been on the market. You heard from Jorge about carfilzomib and ixazomib. Carfilzomib is approved for myeloma right now. It is available. It's a more specific and probably more potent uh, version of a proteasome inhibitor. It's not available currently in any way for Waldenstrom's, although at least it is in Canada. And uh, ixazomib you've heard of already, uh, mentioned by uh, Jorge with the study they're running. Uh, Ixazomib is the oral, the, ca uh, the oral tablet version or capsule version of bortezomib, so a lot easier to take and probably less uh, risk of neuropathy. So Velcade causes neuropathy, always a concern when you're using a drug that causes neuropathy in patients with WM. Um, Ixazomib is uh, compassionately available in Canada at the moment, not approved. Uh, for any reason at the moment, um, or really not available or funded. Uh, so you may be able to get it accessed compassionately right now through the company. So uh, Velcade has the, is the proteasome inhibitor with the most experience. It um, alone has activity, but as you already heard, combinations with rituximab or dexamethasone and rituximab are used. Um, but it, as I mentioned, we worry about the neuropathy associated with it, but it is less common now that we're using uh, Velcade or bortezomib uh, subcutaneous injections instead of IV, and instead of giving it twice weekly, we routinely use it once weekly. So with those maneuvers, the risk of neuropathy is much less. Uh, you do have to remember that these proteasome inhibitors all 
put you at risk of getting shingles. So even more reason to get the Shingrex vaccine. Uh, all patients go on acyclovir or some kind of antivirus medication when they're on these treatments. So those are options, and I'll talk a little bit about why we would choose any of them at, later, um, but just so you're familiar with them. Um, so Jane ends up receiving six cycles of venomustine and rituximab. She achieves a partial response. Um, and uh, again, her IgM uh, becomes, goes low, her lymph nodes do resolve, her hemoglobin comes close to normal, and she does well for a couple of years, so not terribly long this time. Her IgM reappears, and she's watched for another year. Um, so uh, this time she does have a bone marrow test repeated, and we do now have access to mid-88 mutation testing. Uh, this is pretty standard now across Canada. Most centers will have access to it. Um, but is there a better way than bone marrow testing? Because I know a lot of you really dislike having bone marrows performed. Um, it's not uh, our favorite thing to do to you either. Um, and so this is a, a study that Suzanne Trudell and I are initiating at Princess Margaret. Thank you very much for the WMFC for supporting this study, where we're looking at trying to test for these mutations in the blood instead of having to do the bone marrow. So this is dependent on the fact that tumors can either shed cells, so circulating tumor cells, into the blood, or they can actually just shed parts of their DNA into the blood. And why is this so more than normal cells? Well, it may be because there's dead, dying tissue that allows around the tumors, tumors that allow the DNA to enter the blood. But it, it is pretty easy to access the DNA in the blood and then allows us to do genetic or molecular profiling. Um, and that can be helpful when, number one, you don't want bone marrows performed, which are tedious and hard to do repeatedly. Uh, sometimes bone marrow samples are suboptimal if you're not getting a good sample. You can always get a pretty good sample from blood. Um, bone marrow can be patchy, so it depends on where you're going. You might not get much tissue. Uh, that has Waldenstrom's in it, in the blood. It's just shed uh, just pretty uniformly. Um, and and the, as I mentioned already, it's much more convenient and comfortable for patients. So we're uh, close to opening this trial where we're really just looking at uh, the feasibility of collecting the blood and doing the mutation testing. Dr. Trudell has, she's mostly a myeloma physician, and she has validated her panel of mutations using cell-free, we call it cell-free DNA from the blood um, in myeloma. And she's uh, reported that uh, the concordance, or rather the similarity in results with bone marrow is about 96, 97%, so it's really similar. And in fact, uh, she was able to detect a few, four more mutations in the peripheral blood samples than in the bone marrow. So maybe it's even more sensitive than doing the bone marrow. Um, so we are going to be opening up. And basically, if you're coming into my clinic, we'll just approach you as to whether you'd like to give blood. Uh, and those patients who uh, agree to having a bone marrow will be able to correlate the bone marrow and the blood sampling. So this is something that we should be opening shortly. If you are interested, you can certainly be referred to us if you're one of my patients. When you come through clinic, we're just trying to capture patients as they come through. And um, the very least would be a blood test, but if you're interested, we'll do a bone marrow as well. If you need a bone marrow done for your disease anyways, then these are, um, then we, you know, this is perfect opportunity. This allows us to access testing for CXCR4, all those BTK mutations that we've ta talked about for resistance and a variety of other mutation testing because currently CXCR4 is not even available routinely at our institution. Very few centers have access to it. Uh, some of my patients have gone to the U.S. to get it. Um, so uh, again, I just want to thank the WMFC for supporting that study. Um, so let's go back to Jane, our case again. So she's now starting to progress again. Uh, with dropping hemoglobin. She pre presents in the usual same way almost every time she progresses, and now she starts abrutinib. So we are very fortunate that uh, we have access to abrutinib. It was first approved as a single drug treatment in 2016, 
uh, on a conditional approval by Health Canada, conditional on a confirmatory study, which was this one, the Innovate trial that you've already heard about that we participated in, where um, the patients were put on ibrutinib plus rituximab uh, versus just rituximab. So in Canada, we rarely use rituximab alone. It doesn't really lead to uh, very long responses, especially because we don't have access to the extended treatment where it's eight doses versus four. Uh, so um, uh, this study, uh, as you've already heard, has, was uh, very positive uh, for the abrutinib and rituximab combination. Although as we've seen with other types of diseases where we add on the rituximab, we may not need the two drugs uh, you've heard already that maybe those patients who have CXCR4, uh, you may want or have more aggressive disease, it can help get you into a faster response. Um, it, currently, uh, just last month, uh, ibrutinib plus rituximab was approved by Health Canada, but not yet. As you know, in Canada, the funding for drugs is provincial, so even though Health Canada is federal and they approve drugs and combinations, your province has to approve the funding. And currently in Ontario, we don't have routine funding for the combination. So if you would need the combination, uh, then the rituximab part will need to come from insurance coverage. Uh, the abrutinib is covered now, and uh, covered not by Cancer Care Ontario, but currently under a special program by the manufacturer, Janssen. So one can access it now frontline as of last month. So what if Jane can't tolerate or progresses on abrutinib? So abrutinib is pretty easy to take. Um, it's a pill. You take three of them generally every day. They're a capsule. It's uh, only about 10% of patients can drop their blood counts, which is far better than a lot of the chemo drugs I've talked about. Um, abrutinib, uh, some of the side effects that are more common are diarrhea, but usually they're not. it's not insurmountable diarrhea. It's manageable. Uh, some people get uh, aches and pains in their joints. The big ones we worry about are bleeding. So we don't like people to be on uh, antiplatelet agents like aspirin at the same time. Um, anticoagulation, uh, we can manage the combination, but we just watch closely for bleeding. Like if you're on rivaroxaban or pixaban, uh, we would watch you closely. And then the other thing, uh, risk is atrial fibrillation. You've heard a little bit about that already today the risk of developing a, a sort of a fibrillating heart rhythm. Uh, that's more common in patients who already have heart disease. So anyone who is known to have heart disease, we will watch a little more closely for, um, for this side effect. But it rarely let, um, uh, makes us have to stop the treatment. So you've heard about venetoclax. So yes, it is available in Canada for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, um, but uh, uh, it's, and, and there may be a compassionate access uh, for other diseases like Waldenstrom. So uh, although the, the data, as you've already heard, they look really impressive and encouraging, we're still really waiting for final results, but on occasion one may be able to access this drug uh, in Canada. I'm going to talk a bit about stem cell transplant, uh, and then there is always opportunity for clinical trials. Um, you've already heard about how venetoclax works, um, and I've mentioned already that it may be available compassionately. Uh, one of the side effects with venetoclax is uh, that it can work so well that it uh, can cause the cancer cells to die so quickly that the products of like, so the dead cells can sort of block off kidneys and cause other problems. So you have to drink really well, hydrate well and uh, the dose starts low and builds up every week until you get to a proper dose. The dosing um, varies between uh, types of disease. Um, and then stem cell transplant. So we haven't transplanted anybody for Waldenstrom's for probably a decade, um, but it is still used in many centers. I don't think Dana-Farber does any transplants. Um, and there's data from the European uh, Bone Marrow Transplant Group, the EBMT, showing that there is efficacy here, but with all the other treatments we have available that we're hearing about from the Dana-Farber Group and others, it's largely been relegated to 
um, something that you might consider only in uh, unusual circumstances. For instance, if patients have a complication of amyloid, which is where the, the light chain part, if you recall Dr. Mattis' talk about the antibodies, the light chain part can deposit in tissues kind of in this fibrillar pattern, and that can cause, uh, um, that's what we call amyloid deposition. When you have that, uh, we may consider performing a stem cell transplant as we would do if you had myeloma and amyloid. Um, so in summary, I'm just gonna quickly run through our approaches. So first line, we still use benamustine rituximab as first line standard in Canada. And then it's plus or minus for rituximab maintenance. I think it's still routinely offered uh, and available in Canada. But with some of the emerging uh, side effect data, we, we may not push it hard. Uh, then there are all these other conventional alternatives, which I always used to have on my slides. Uh, so, you know, my, if you have neuropathy or low blood counts or you're kind of frail, we might use single agent rituximab. Uh, bortezomib works well to bring the IgM down fast, so hyperviscosity is uh, an indication perhaps to consider bortezomib. Uh, it doesn't require any dose adjustments. If you have kidney failure, it can even be used in people who are on dialysis, so it's safe. I'm mentioning these things, but really, as we start to have access to ibrutinib, even front line, it's largely changing all of these other options, moving them down the road. And I'd say we almost never use chlorambucil, um, ben and fludarabine is rare. We still may uh, uh, prefer benamustine treatment uh, for patients who have bulky disease. We can shrink their lymph nodes fast. Uh, but with the brutinib availability frontline, uh, it, it does become uh, really a patient preference option. Uh, brutinib is given, it's easy to take, it's a pill but you take it long term, it's a commitment. You have to be on it for as long as it works. Whereas some of these, all these other treatments like bendamustine rituximab are given for a finite period of six months or even less, and then you can ride with that for a number of years. So I often have to counsel patients on those two different approaches, which would you prefer? Um, and that's why we're so uh, looking forward to treatments with uh, drugs like venetoclax where you could get into a deep response and stop treatment at one or two years down the road. Relapse guidelines have traditionally stated if you responded to your first treatment, you can repeat, the uh, repeat it again if you've had a response of at least one or two years, it's kind of vague. But again, the landscape is changing. We have access to ibrutinib, and I would say that most patients would prefer to move on to ibrutinib next. Again, remembering this is a long-term commitment. You stay on it. If you have uh, problems with uh, bleeding or other complications that might get worse with ibrutinib, then very reasonable if you responded well to, say, your benamustine rituximab the first time to repeat it. And as I mentioned, the rituximab is available as long as you've gone at least a year out from your first time rituximab. It will be funded. So I'm just going to conclude by stating that you've heard today all the significant advances in Waldenstrom's therapy. And even in just this one patient I've taken you through over the last two decades, uh, we can see the evolution of treatments. So there are many options available, even in Canada, but you just have to temper your excitement. And I uh, always consider involvement in clinical trials. So um, you can always uh, uh, email or call Steve, because wherever he is, he's gonna respond. If he's standing on a tarmac, uh, getting onto a plane, he usually responds faster than I do, I'm sorry. But anyways, uh, so if you're interested in trials, I do encourage you to go that route. We frequently don't have very many Waldenstrom's clinical trials open, but as I mentioned, the one trial with our cell-free DNA, we're happy to see you about. So thank you very much.